G'day, welcome to the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name is Chris Muir, I'm an ADF product manager working for Oracle Corporation. In today's episode, we're going to be extending on from the previous episode where we started talking about topologies. In the previous episode, we looked at WebLogic Server and ADF topologies and the ideas of clustering and ADF runtimes. What we want to do in this particular episode is broaden that out to considering system topologies. So this is really looking at not just the middleware layer, but considering other layers such as your database, your LDAP servers, and so on and so forth. Now, in this particular episode, we're not going to go into the ins and outs of configuring databases and configuring LDAP servers. We're still really looking at this from a middleware perspective. But what we hope to give you is an insight into the number of different production system topologies that customers out there are using. The goal of this particular episode then is to make you go and explore those topologies, particularly looking at the WebLogic server documentation for more information to see which topology fits your needs. Again, as usual, there is no one size fits all topology here for everyone's needs. Different needs, different requirements, different price points. Um, basically, you've got to make these choices yourself. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look at some of the system topologies and let's start out with a very simple system topology that will suit clients or customers who only have a low volume demands on their WebLogic servers. Now, for some Oracle customers who have built ADF applications, they know that they're going to have very few users and in addition, they might even have no requirement for failover. So in that case, a suitable production topology might be a single managed server in WebLogic Server to satisfy those client requests. You don't really need to go to a complex setup in order to run an ADF application. Of course, in terms of system topologies, most ADF systems will include a relational database that they're connecting to, and in terms of authenticating users, will also make a query or will access an LDAP server. But if you imagine from there, there are going to be some customers out there who do have a need for failover, or at least their system should be up 24 by 7. Now failover is an interesting situation, or high availability, in the fact that, well, there's kind of a sliding scale here. There, there isn't an actual yes or no, does my system support failover? You've got to actually consider your requirements and what type of failover you require. So one solution to that is to have a non-clustered scalable topology where you have two managed servers that are basically fronted by a load balancer and the load balancer when it detects one of the managed servers goes down will just redirect client requests to the other managed server. Now in this case there is no state failover between these two separate managed servers and some customers are quite fine with this. If the one system goes down and a user's kicked off and they have to log in and go into another system, that's probably fine from some customers' perspectives. Okay? Now, again, a solution like this would still typically require a relational database and an LDAP server. So when you think about your system topologies, you've of course got to think about all the other infrastructure that needs to be put in place to support your ADF applications. Yet, in terms of failover, what if you're a customer who needs better than this? Rather than when one managed server goes down, that the user's state's lost and you just force them to log into the other managed server through the load balancer, that in fact when one managed server goes down, you want to ensure that when the user switched over to another managed server, that whatever the user was doing, their state as such is maintained and they continue on. As you can imagine, this would be a critical solution for the likes of, say, Amazon and shopping carts. You don't really want customers to lose their shopping cart if a server goes down. So a solution for that is this high volume topology here with where WebLogic Server we now introduce clustered managed servers like we talked about in the previous episode. So with client requests coming in and the load balancer taken care of detecting and fending the managed servers go down, basically if one managed server goes down and a user is on that managed server, thanks to the serialization of their state of their ADF application to the other managed server, when the load balancer switches the user to that other server, they really should see no difference in the application. They won't be, basically, they won't be kicked out. Whatever they are doing should still be there and they can continue on. When we start to get up to these high volume topologies, though, we tend to also be interested about other performance requirements. So in a high volume topology, it's quite common to introduce web caches in order to basically offload the uh, serving of static content such as images, CSS files and so on and so forth 
to a separate server such that the WebLogic server isn't basically overwhelmed by those requests in addition. In turn, it's typical in a high volume topology to have multiple HTTP servers as well to offload some of the processing that's required by the managed servers or the application. So for instance, the processing of your SSL digital certificates could actually be done at the HP server level. Basically, we're introducing multiple different servers to take care of different parts of the overall request, such that the WebLogic servers are doing what they do best, and that's serving the application state. Of course, again, still in the high volume topology, we have our Oracle databases and our LDAP servers. Now with that topology in mind, hey, great, we've certainly got the ability there to start scaling this out, having lots of managed servers, lots of HP servers, lots of web cache servers, and so on and so forth. But the problem with this particular topology is if all these servers are located at, say, one location, and you have a disaster on site, well, again, there's nothing much any of those servers can do for you if they lose power or they all get burnt down. So something that WebLogic Service supports and the whole of Fusion Middleware actually supports as well is this concept of active-active topologies where basically you take the uh, high volume topology that we just talked about but you duplicate it across different remote physical sites. So maybe you have a set of servers at your current HQ and then maybe a one kilometre away you have another set of servers or something along those lines. The idea with an active-active topology then is that the clients actually hit a global load balancer that pushes the requests between the different active topologies. So you do get the benefit of more scalability, but in addition, in terms of disasters, well, essentially, if one site burns down or loses power, the other site's still up, and you'll still be able to undertake business with the clients. Now, if you read about WebLogic server documentation, they even talk about what's called an active-inactive topology. And this is the concept where the inactive topology, basically all the servers there are basically powered down and only brought up if the active topology has a disaster. So this way you're not consuming, say, valuable resources, but in the case of a disaster, you'll still be able to switch over gracefully. Now, Putting these concepts of disaster recovery aside, something else you need to consider in terms of your topology is security. Now, remember I'm an ADF product manager here and I'm not really a WebLogic server guru or a security guru, but I'm sure many of the administrators out there would know that typically with your servers, you tend to set them up in what's called a demilitarized zone or DMZ. And you have outbound and inbound firewalls that basically stops outside traffic getting to those very critical internal relational databases and security systems. So at most sites you'll find that the security administrators will set, will set up an outbound firewall which will deal with trying to block any miscellaneous uh, traffic coming from clients out there to servers they're not meant to access. And in terms of the inbound firewall, in case any hackers happen to get through, again, this will try and shut down any unauthorized requests from any of the compromised internal systems, or I should say middleware systems, to accessing the backend systems. Another thing that you need to consider in terms of your security topology is SSL termination. You'd appreciate that when a browser actually accesses a server, typically it would be over HTTP or more likely for secure connection, it's over HTTPS using SSL and digital certificates. Now in terms of each one of these servers and the connections between them, a good question is, is well, is each one of those encrypted and are you going to have to deal with digital certificates all the way down the chain? Now from a customer's perspective, it makes sense to have the request between the client and the load balancer all encrypted. Customers, for instance, when using shopping cart applications and entering credit card details, really don't want to see unencrypted traffic there. But in terms of your internal systems, such as the DMZ and even your backend systems, should you be encrypting the traffic between the separate nodes there? Well, without a doubt, when you look at the analysis of um, security breaches in enterprises, if I remember correctly, back in my university days, it was something like 80% of all security breaches actually occur within an organization, not by outside hackers. So you might have staff members with wire sniffers or tools like Wireshark. If the traffic across 
the actual nodes and network layer is not actually encrypted, those staff members may be able to see something that they shouldn't. So again, from an encryption and a security perspective, maybe you need to think about actually making sure that all the over-the-wire communications between all the nodes in your Fusion Middleware solutions are actually encrypted and secured for this reason. So the end goal of this episode is particularly for project managers or people that haven't really worked with larger system topologies previously to give you an idea of all the different infrastructure elements that you can introduce. So we went from a very simple one web logic server solution with a database and an LDAP server and then we scaled that right out to deal with high volumes, bringing in web caches, load balancers, HTTP servers and then even talked about disaster recovery scenarios. Now, even so, in all of that, did you notice there are even things along the lines of, well, failover requirements, where some customers may think there's just a failover requirement. There's, in fact, degrees of failover and different types of failover that you can support based on your system topologies. And again, these are things that you're going to need to decide and plan for. So that concludes the two episodes and looking at um, WebLogic Server and System Topologies. In the next set of episodes on the ADF Architecture TV channel, we're going to look at the concepts of user interface design or more specifically, the concepts of user experience design or UX for short. UX is a very exciting area of computing these days. If you've ever done any mobile design, you should have a good understanding about UX. And UX is very important to enterprise ADF solutions as well. So in a number of episodes, Grant Ronald will be introducing some of the concepts that hopefully you should take on board for your ADF systems in terms of user experience. So thanks again for joining us on the ADF Architecture TV channel today, and we hope you'll return to watch the following episodes very, very soon.